Taking a slight reprieve in the town of Tristram from battling the forces of hell, we happen upon a curiosity. Behind Griswold's blacksmith and just south of the fork leading to Adria's shack, we find a festering nest of some kind. Otherworldly tendrils protrude from the ground and a cracked cyst bubbles in its center. Seemingly composed of unnatural flora, we don't exactly understand what it is, if a plant at all, but it seems menacing and blocks our path nonetheless. We have also heard whispers of a farmer named Lester to the north who's new to town thanks to the Hellfire expansion and has been asking around about the aberration. Heading north and following the river, we find Lester, an inconspicuous farmer wearing a straw brim hat, overalls and rocking on his heels as if unawares or unconcerned of hell itself terrorizing the lands and the town of Tristram. His only concern, the safety of his trio of cows. If we decide to approach him before reaching level two of the dungeon, he says, I need something done, but I couldn't impose on a perfect stranger. Perhaps after you've been here a while, I might feel more comfortable asking a favor. After reaching level two of the dungeon and returning to Lester once more, he then weighs, Oh, such a trouble I have. Well, maybe... No, I, I couldn't impose on you, what with all the other troubles. Maybe after you've cleansed the church of some of those creatures, you could come back and spare a little time to help a poor farmer? If we decide to seek out Lester again after reaching the catacombs, he hints. Oh, I could use your help, but perhaps after you've saved the catacombs from the desecration of those beasts. After reaching level seven of the catacombs, he commends. I see in you the potential for greatness. Perhaps sometime while you are fulfilling your destiny, you could stop by and do a little favor for me? It's only after reaching level 9 of the caves and level 15 will Lester finally seek our aid, saying, So, you're the hero everyone's been talking about. Perhaps you could help a poor, simple farmer out of a terrible mess? At the edge of my orchard, well, just south of here, there's a horrible thing swelling out of ground. I can't get to my crops or my bales of hay, and my poor cows will starve. The witch gave this to me and said that it would blast that thing out of my field. If you could destroy it, I would be forever grateful. I'd do it myself, but someone has to stay here with the cows. It's then we received the quest, The Farmer's Orchard, and a rune bomb from Lester to aid him in freeing the path for his ailing cows. If we head south to the nest and are unable to work the rune contraption, I can't cast that here. We can then again ask Lester once more for clues on how to destroy it, but he simply laments. I knew that it couldn't be as simple as that witch made it sound. It's a sad world when you can't even trust your neighbors. So, it was Adria the Witch who gave him the rune and instructions. We can try to get an explanation from Adria directly. I sense a soul in search of answers. But she doesn't seem to recall the bomb whatsoever. And so, after much confusion, we take the rune bomb from our inventory and toss it at the center of the throbbing mass of tendrils, and it explodes in a heap of vile gunk and icor, oozing from its exposed maw. We then rush back to Lester and he thanks. I heard the explosion from here. Many thanks to you, kind stranger. What with all these things coming out of the ground, monsters taking over the church and so forth, these are trying times. I'm but a poor farmer, but here, take this with my great thanks. 
Once the bomb has gone off successfully, we can return to Lester and he will drop the Auric Amulet, an item that has specifically been added to Hellfire. It's worn in the amulet slot and doesn't provide any stat bonuses, but it does allow our character to carry over 10,000 gold per slot, up from 5,000 gold in Vanilla Diablo, when the amulet is equipped. This makes it possible to save more gold from one game to the next and to purchase items that take up to six spaces in the inventory, such as full plate mail, that cost more than 170,000 gold, which was impossible in Diablo since the game required you to have enough free space to hold the item that you were buying even if your gold was going to go away in the transaction. So it is handy to have on your person. Although our quest of the farmer's orchard is now complete and we have a valuable item, we still have the wretched hive to contend with. Fearing for the safety of the inhabitants of Tristram, we then head to the hive, looking inside its disgusting, oozing hole and realize there is in fact a cave system below. Stealing our resolve and holding our breath, we wriggle our way inside. Upon entering, we hear, We have long lain dormant, and the time to awaken has come. After our long sleep, we are filled with great hunger. Soon now we shall feed. Echoing from the putrid chamber itself, we're immediately warned by an unknown entity of an incoming threat from a being who has laid dormant till now and intends to feed on us and perhaps the townsfolk above. As then we get a better look at our surroundings. The green walls drip with a gooey webbing. The hole in which we entered resembles, for lack of a better word, an anus. Vestigial growths protrude from the ground, bordering on the lewd and unseemly, and the ground itself is ridged like a brain, and porous tubes trigger our trypophobia. Stepping through the sludge, we see a green acid pool as a gaggle of inhabitants come to contend with an unwanted intruder, or perhaps snack. The shredded appear as wispy undead mummies, more wrappings and air than solid, giving us no end of trouble slashing through their ethereal form. Stingers whip their venomous tails at our heels, looking like something straight out of the thing or aliens. And the bloated fell twin, a two-headed beast cries out as we pierce its globby flesh. As they fall, they leave us to hack almost impotently at their shredded brethren. Once successful, we head north once more, looting a chest only to be charged by horned hellbores, gifted with a ridiculous amount of knockback, and they send us reeling throughout the cavern and into a new enemy, the spider-like arachnon. Once unimpeded, we search the area and find, instead of barrels, the nest is adorned with fleshy pods guarded by the denizens therein, and they sometimes bequeath items exploding in a gunk similar in fashion to the nest entrance above. After some searching, we find the second level of the hive. Once inside, we see it's browner than its counterpart, and as we move to check, a nearby chest are immediately pelted with blue streams of magicka. The source are tentacled psycho orbs with giant reptile-like eyes. These drones too seem to be guarding the now fully active breeding ground of whatever creature had warned us of our impending demise. As we press on through the level, we're then assaulted by bouncing hawk spawn, round testicular creatures with sinister grins. We cannot help but wonder, what is spawning these creatures? Is it hell itself, or is it happenstance? We've disturbed a peculiar and alien race of beings, or if we're just uneducated on how diverse the biology of flora and fauna that Sanctuary boasts. It's then when entering the third level of the hive, we are more fully regaled with man's impending doom from an unknown yet malevolent entity. And our brood shall overrun the fields that men call home. Our tendrils shall envelop this world and we will feast on the flesh of its denizens. Man shall become our chattel and sustenance. 
However, it's not until the fourth level, after clearing out the sentries, do we come face to face with the Baleful Presence, known only as their promise of the woes to come, the Defiler. Come closer, morsel. I smell your terror, and I hunger. The insectoid defiler rushes us, sporting ten limbs, with eight for piercing our hide alone, looking like a hybrid of a millipede, a praying mantis, and an unholy reptile standing ten feet tall. It backs us into a nearby acid bath, raining down blows on us. However, shield held high and sword arm at the ready, we press our own assault, jabbing Griswold's edge through its scaly abdomen as it sprays yellow ichor on the ground. Now a dead, crumpled husk. <laughs> on its corpse, we find, what's this? A cathedral map. Unsure of the symbology of a bounty it was protecting, we portal out of the oozing hollowed hive and back to safety. It's then we seek out Lester the farmer for guidance once more, but he disappeared, and there's no sign of how he vanished. Our only clue is the map. After felling the foul fiend, known only as the Defiler, neath his nest, which rests but a stone's throw from this sleepy hamlet known as Tristram, we reach in our inventory and pull out the cathedral map, which he inexplicably dropped. Etched on the parchment is a picture of not a very accurate rendition of the town of Tristram, perhaps? The houses are littered about the river, as if scrawled by someone who'd never actually spent more than an hour there. But unmistakable is the cathedral to its north. In front of the cathedral, words are scrawled, put me here, and point to a crucifix in the graveyard. But what? Where? And why? It's only after returning to town and asking around, we see Jillian the barmaid, who tends to aid her ailing grandmother. And she says, My grandmother often tells me stories about the strange forces that inhabit the graveyard outside of the church, and it may well interest you to hear one of them. She said that if you were to leave the proper offering in the cemetery, enter the cathedral to pray for the dead, and then return, the offering would be altered in some strange way. I don't know if this is just the talk of an old sick woman, but anything seems possible these days. Instead of simply scoffing at what possibly is the feverish ranting of the aged and infirmed, we're instead intrigued. Gillian herself has stated her grandmother relays visions from time to time, and her remark about offerings to the cemetery match up with this map. But what could be buried in the cemetery, as the dead tend to tell no secrets? Although, these are strange times indeed. And so we ponder, are there any other clues we can garner from the townsfolk themselves? We then head to Wirt the Peg-Legged Boy, a young mercantile type that's probably dealt with a map or two in his short time. And he also has a clear view of the cathedral to which he greedily poses. Hmm, a vast and mysterious treasure, you say? Hmm, maybe I could be interested in picking up a few things from you. Or better yet, don't you need some rare and expensive supplies to get you through this ordeal? I guess it is a map, but who said anything about treasure? Intrigued, we then see Ogden, the tavern owner, who scolds. I'll bet that Wirt saw you coming and put on an act just so he could laugh at you later when you're running around the town with your nose in the dirt. I'd ignore it. Although that may be true, Wirt planting the idea of lost treasure in our head, this dialogue is also shared with Wirt's own cut quest, Lost Treasure, and so is being recycled by Sierra to fit their own Hellfire narrative. It's then we seek out the wisdom of Cain, the Elder, who shares. There was a time when this town was a frequent stop for travelers from far and wide. Much has changed since then, but hidden caves and buried treasure are common fantasies of any child. Wirt seldom indulges in youthful games, so it may just be his imagination. Oh, so Cain also seems to be a non-believer. But what does Farnham the Drunk think of our map? Listen here, come close. I don't know if you know what I know, but you have really got something here. That's a map. 
Riveting insight as always, Barnum old boy. We then see Griswold, the blacksmith, who leers at our map momentarily, but then rebukes us for even entertaining such an idea. A what? This is foolishness! There's no treasure buried here in Tristram! Let me see that. Uh, look, these drawings are inaccurate. They don't match our town at all! I'd keep my mind on what lies below the cathedral, and not what lies below our topsoil. But we are looking for what's below cathedral... Uh, never mind. Next, Pepin the Healer, ever the pragmatist, waves dismissively. I really don't have time to discuss some map you are looking for. I have many sick people that require my help, and yours as well. With all other options exhausted, we travel to the outskirts of town. There, Adria the Witch stands by her shack, hands on hips, and advises. Maintain your quest. Finding a treasure that is lost is not easy. Finding a treasure that is hidden, less so. I will leave you with this. Do not let the sands of time confuse your search. Maintain our quest and don't let the sands of time confuse our search. Perhaps she means that we shouldn't stand idle and look by the source of our quest, the cathedral itself. And who has all the time in the world but the dead in the graveyard? With the map in hand, we race to the cathedral's entrance, realizing the inaccurate map places the cemetery at its front. However, there is a graveyard adjacent. In the cemetery, we see a crypt, which we've never really paid attention to before. A winged succubus sits atop it, arms outstretched and body thick, which was the fashion at the time. With no other real leads, we look at the map once more and realize it urges us to put it physically somewhere in the cemetery. And so we lay it down on the crypt. To our shock, the lid falls back and reveals a staircase leading down into a red glow below that matches the ominous cathedral lighting behind us. Curious, yet perhaps against our better judgment, we cautiously step inside. This is a place of great power. Entering the crypt, we're confronted with a large stone room, lavished with ornate carvings and a hellish hue of flames bubbling underfoot, barely contained by the tile below. Two demonic sentries sit guarding the door with a demon's crest, eyes aglow, warns against any unwanted interlopers. We immediately head north and open the door to be set upon by undead grave diggers. Shovel in hand, they amble towards us, falling into the doorway. Somehow, we think, it may not be treasure that is being guarded, but it's lucky we didn't end up selling worth the map, as he'd be liable to lose his other foot down here. Before we can finish the thought, skull wings appear, aberrations in servitude of whom we are yet to establish, but unholy is their presence nonetheless. When killed, the fiend explodes in a ball of hellfire, but not before we're pushed out of the room by a hail of fireballs from unseen enemies. Contending with the skull wings seems easy in comparison to their casting counterparts. The fire-flinging fiends known as Lich are excruciatingly painful to deal with as a sword-wielding warrior. Only by cornering them can we effectively fell the foes as they drip with magma and fall to the floor. But as soon as we face them, they will try and stay three tiles from our range, fleeing into larger groups, causing havoc dragging us into their kin as they are free to lick our hide with an unending deluge of destruction. In hunting down these lich, we find something seemingly benign, a crumpled note, although unsure of its full text, we pocket it for later. The onslaught, it seems, has just begun. Near the entrance to level two, we're set upon by a gaggle of grave diggers who seem to just soak up attacks and not much else, but we learn that they are A, shambling yet persistent with a decent hit of the shovel, and B, if allowed to dig, will regenerate hit points. Uh. 
Just to the south, we see encircled in hellish pillars a journal entitled The Meeting that reads, I have tried spells, threats, abjuration, and bargaining with this foul creature to no avail. My methods of enslaving lesser demons seem to have no effect on this fearsome beast. This doesn't seem promising. Some madman has enslaved demons? A practice banned by all the major mage clans, and he seems to have found one that cannot be bound, and perhaps is still loose. Close by, we then find a room unlike any other. Inside lies two diamond patterns and a tile with a glowing stone in its corner. Although not a quest or explicitly stated, this is known as the cornerstone of the world. If one was to voyage to the stone with one character and drop off whatever item you wish to transfer, it would then copy to another characters on the stone and the save game with the item would still be there. The next game you create with any single player character on any difficulty level will have the same item available to them sitting on the cornerstone when they arrive. An amazing function before any shared stash was established, but there is also lore attached when dropping said item, which reads, And in the year of the golden light, it was so decreed that a great cathedral be raised. The cornerstone of this holy place was to be carved from the translucent stone Antirial, named for the angel who shared his power with the Haradrim. In the year of drawing shadows, the ground shook and the cathedral shattered and fell as the building of catacombs and castles began and man stood against the ravages of the sin war. The ruins were scavenged for their stones. And so it was that the cornerstone vanished from the eyes of man. The stone was of this world and of all worlds, as the light is both within all things and beyond all things. Light and unity are the products of this holy foundation, a unity of purpose and a unity of possession. Now, it should be of note, although Hellfire is not considered technically canon by Blizzard, it's amazing that this law seems to be, at least in some part, to reflect the world stone in later games, which was, of course, pivotal, especially to Diablo 2's plot. And its ability to shape reality, this cornerstone would be the perfect catalyst to create new items and was gifted by Tyrael, it seems, or Antirial, as he was known, as were the soul stones to the Herodrum in later games so it lines up incredibly well if it was a chunk of the world stone and for discarded lore it is actually interesting nonetheless. After leaving the majestic cornerstone behind we head to the ominous entrance to level 2. As we venture deeper into the crypt, we again find a second piece of the torn note, forced to face torrents of dark magic, thanks to the lich and the new pets, the oversized tomb rats. <laughs> We then happen across the second journal of the summoner, simply titled The Tirade. My home is slowly becoming corrupted by the vileness of this unwanted prisoner. The crypts are full of shadows that move just beyond the corners of my vision. The faint scrabble of claws dances at the edges of my hearing. They are searching, I think, for this journal. Clearly overwhelmed, a victim of summoning demons from the burning hells, albeit at his own hand. It's on the third level of the crypt we're assaulted by the nightmarish reapers, fleshy gargoyle-esque creatures bearing deadly scythes. It seems the reapers were guarding one of the summoner's tomes, titled Narkrol. The entrapped creature's howls of fury keep me from gaining much needed sleep. It rages against the one who sent it to the void, and it calls foul curses upon me for trapping it here. Its words fill my heart with terror, and yet I cannot block out its voice. 
So, is this the name of the creature that is clawing at the recesses of the summoner's sanity? It's only after defeating another reaper guarding a final tome do we learn the truth. Simply titled, The End. <sighs> My time is quickly running out. I must record the ways to weaken the demon, and then conceal that text, lest his minions find some way to use my knowledge to free their lord. I hope that whoever finds this journal will seek the knowledge. And so we discover, to aid weakening whatever creature the summoner has wrought on the world, that the last piece of the note is needed. However, we see it is but a stone's throw from the tome itself, guarded by a singular bone demon. Which we promptly send back to the burning hells. Just what I was looking for. After retrieving the note and descending to the fourth and final level, we combine the pieces into a single note, another diary entry from the summoner who called forth this Narkrull and imprisoned him as a dying effort when the demon proved too strong to dispel or defeat. The note itself imparts how to release Narkrull while greatly weakening the beast in the process. Whoever finds this scroll is charged with stopping the demonic creature that lies within these walls. My time is over. Even now, its hellish minions claw at the frail door behind which I hide. I have hobbled the demon with arcane magic and encased it within great walls, but I fear that will not be enough. The spells found in my three grimoires will provide you protected entrance to his domain, but only if cast in their proper sequence. The levers at the entryway will remove the barriers and free the demon. Touch them not. Use only these spells to gain entry, or his power may be too great for you to defeat. Sir. We now know how to weaken this Narkrull, but first, we must find its personal durance. However, it is easier said than done. Guarding the lever, we're confronted with a twisted cacophony of evil flesh things as they're known, with single eyes amidst their fleshy abdomen and gnarled spike that attacks us, before they themselves turn into a puddle at our feet. It's then we find what must be the prison of Narkrull himself. A pentagram seals the door and a horned demon's head protrudes menacingly from its center. If we choose to ignore the tomes, which isn't wise, and not perform the ritual, we can pull the lever instead, but Narkrull will rush out of his incarceration saying, Out of my way, wretched human. Retribution calls for he whom you call Diablo! Kral is a huge, bipedal, tentacle-adorned demon, roughly the size of Diablo and looking to be constructed of nightmarish flesh and sinew, spikes protruding from vines on its back as they strike at us that kill us where we stand. <laughs> Instead, however, we decide to weaken Narkrull, as the tomes had guided, and read the books in front of his chamber in the specific order mentioned by the summoner. In spiritu sanctum, predictum otium. Narkrull rushes us once again. But now, we stand a chance. What? Who dares disturb the great Narkrull? Your life is forfeit, mortal. Although he does significant damage, we look for a better footing in his chamber, but to no avail. We must stand our ground and hack at his corpulent abdomen, jamming Griswold's edge into his belly until he finally succumbs to our attacks and falls in a heap, as if whatever demonic magic held him in this realm gave out altogether with his body. 
on his corpse, we find a book of apocalypse, a magic long bow, great sword, and war staff. And so, with Narkral dead, and the summoner's minions gone, the crypt is now clear, and the town is safe from Hellfire's horrors for now. Hi, I'm free. Free to confront the one who banished me to the boy, Diablo. Hi, everybody, and I'm free to reward you, little mortal, with these Aerosmith tickets. You'll be getting backstage passes. You'll get to meet Steven Tyler and the whole band this Friday at the Coliseum. Thanks for getting me out of there. By the way, I'm going to have to kill you. I'll be right back with the trafficking weather together. <laughs> After entering the festering hive neath the outskirts of the town of Tristram and surfacing for some much needed clean air, we happen upon a curiosity. Just south of Adria the Witch's shack and north of the nest stands a lone little girl? She cannot even be the paltry ten years of the young rapscallion known as Wirt, except We've never even heard of this girl before, nor seen her about town. And yet, here she stands, out in the wilds, wearing a blue dress, a bonnet atop her head, eyes looking to be almost brimming with tears. We ask her, what is her name? And more importantly, what is she doing alone in the dangerous woods? It's then she introduces herself simply as Celia, before pleading. I lost Theo, I lost my best friend. We were playing over by the river and Theo said he wanted to go look at the big green thing. I said we shouldn't, but we snuck over there. And then suddenly a bug came out. We ran away, but Theo fell down and the bug grabbed him and took him away. This does not bode well. The new arrival, Celia has lost her friend Theo playing by the river. Is he too a young boy we have yet to meet? And if this bug had grabbed him when he fell down, it sounds like he was dragged to the nest of the denizens who infest the hive below. Axe in hand and ready to cleave through the entire hellish hive to find the boy, we enter the nest once more. Inside, our frantic search begins. We gingerly open the fleshy pods about the hive as they seem to store items that the residents have pilfered during their topside escapades and most of the items seem unmolested and hopefully we can say the same for Theo but his chances are not good. Now, as an aside, I've been getting a lot of comments during the Hellfire playthrough with concerns that Hellfire's setting and enemies especially don't seem to amply fit within the Diablo universe or lore. And while I personally agree, it was in a recent comment from Daniel Zawacki that further delved into why this is and I thought that I would share it as it's very poignant, which reads, Hellfire is a third party expansion, but was also an attempt to bring a Lovecraftian element into the Diablo Diablo universe. The hive area was populated with beasts that were supposed to be eldritch and otherworldly, and the crypt itself is full of cult-like references, and its boss is supposed to be some super ancient otherworldly demon, but I won't ruin the surprise till the end. And while I don't think Sierra kept in line with Blizzard South's original vision, it is interesting that they attempted to keep the horror vibe intact, but went for, better or worse, in a direction that's not really congruent with the vanilla Diablo's gothic horror setting. It's on the third level of the hive, by the entrance to a large cavern and pools of acid, we're besieged by a pack of ballish oddities named Hawk Spawn. More a nuisance than anything, we're disgusted by these bizarre bouncing babies, hacking them in twain and wondering what the hell keeps spawning these things. However, with all our searching, we're no closer to finding the errant boy Theo. Somewhat sullenly, we resurface to bear the bad news to young Celia, but she entreats. Did you find him? You gotta find Theodo, please. He's just little. He can't take care of himself. Please. We know we cannot leave the child to his fate, alive or otherwise. And resolve renewed, we head deep into the nasty nest once more. 
Again, entering the large cavern, we begin our search, checking pods in case humans are somehow bound to them, desperate for any lead. Annoyingly though, another hawkspawn comes bouncing along. We dutifully put aside our axe and punch the menace square in its maniacal mouth as it explodes in a fanfare of foul flesh. Exasperated that we can get no reprieve, we move north and contend with another hawkspawn and venom tail when, oh sweet Akarat's aunt. That's what's been spawning these nasty creatures, a freaking hawk demon. It stands 10 feet tall, a cacophony of flesh, bone and nothing else good piled in a mound. As we fell the necro orb blasting its unending magicka at us, the hawk demon is content to birth a gaggle of new spawn to antagonize us with. We immediately regret punching that baby, as we're now surrounded by pulsing prunes of meat. Destroying the last of the demon spawn grants us no respite. So then we're forced to face the big daddy itself, or mama, whatever it is. It ain't good. The demon decides spawning time is over, flailing wildly at us as we fervently swing our axe, cutting clean through mounds of messy muscle and sinew. <sighs> It's not long that the hawk demon is dead in a heap, and we see amidst the gore, what's this? A teddy bear named Theodore. Oh. Whoa. We scoop up the gooey bear and trudge back to Celia. In disbelief, we risked our neck for a plushy bear, and she excitedly states, You found him! You found him! Thank you! Oh, Theo, did those nasty bugs scare you? Hey! Ugh, there's something stuck in your fur. Yuck. Come on, Theo, let's go home. Thanks again, hero person. With that, Celia's search is finished, and she gifts us with a random high-level amulet, which is capable of spawning with any mods any amulet in the game can have. And it's equivalent to finding an amulet in the deepest levels of hell. With plus 22 to vitality, it's well worth having. Though it should be noted, the quest Little Girl and Celia herself are actually inaccessible in Diablo Hellfire's expansion, and only added via editing the command text of the game. And since there's no extra reward, it's purely a stylistic choice if you choose to enable it or not. If you do enjoy the teddy bear rescue element of things and want to help a pixely little girl, then run with it. If not, the hawk demon will still spawn randomly on level 3 just without a quest attached, but you can take your amulet directly from the hawk demon's body itself. Thanks to the developer behind Hellfire's expansion, Sierra, there are unlockable easter eggs which will reveal cut content. One such quest is labeled Jersey's Jersey, added due to the erroneous rumors that were circulating during Diablo 1's release about a secret cow level. Only accessible by altering the command.txt file, the quest will subsequently replace Lester the Farmer in-game and alters the related content. And like the Farmer's Orchard quest, as we head north of the hive and following the river, we find Lester the Farmer is nowhere to be seen. However, there's something different about the area. Previously, Lester had three cows, and now there's four? Wait. Something is very off about this cow. We approach it and give it a slight prod, to which it responds. No. Now, we are no expert on bovine, but I don't think that cow should be bipedal. Nor was that a normal move. We head a few yards to the nearest Bessie and confirm our suspicions. Now that's a moo. We turn to the phony cow once more and he firmly states, I said moo. This seems to be a complete nut, standing in the pasture, wearing a cow suit, no less. We ask the man if he is okay, but he flatly states, Look, I'm just a cow, okay? With a slight exhale, we press him further for answers, but he just simply scoffs. Look, I'm a cow. And you? 
your monster bait. Get some experience under your belt. We'll talk. If we do happen to take the nut's advice and delve deeper into the labyrinth, becoming stronger in our quest, he will say upon our return, Quit bugging me. I'm looking for someone really heroic, and you're not it. I can't trust you. You're going to get eaten by monsters any day now. I need to find someone who's an experienced hero. It's upon our second return from the labyrinth he further boasts. Me? I'm a self-made cow. Make something of yourself and then we'll talk. And upon our third return, after venturing deep into the catacombs below town, the pseudo cow still dares to judge us as lacking, saying, I don't have to explain myself to every tourist that walks by. Don't you have some monsters to kill? Maybe we'll talk later, if you live. It's only after reaching level 9 of the caves and level 15 will the man, or what we presume is a man, known as the Complete Nut, will finally break down and seek our aid, admitting. All right, all right, I'm not really a cow. I don't normally go around like this, but I was sitting at home minding my own business and all of a sudden these bugs and vines and bulbs and stuff started coming out of the floor. It was horrible. If only I had something normal to wear. It wouldn't be so bad. Hey, could you go back to my place and get my suit for me? The brown one, not the gray one. That's for evening wear. I do it myself, but I don't want anyone seeing me like this. Here, take this. You might need it to kill those things that have overgrown everything. You can't miss my house. It's just south of the fork in the river. You know, the one with the overgrown vegetable garden. And so, the man, like Lester, drops a single runic bomb. However, if we ask him further about it, flustered, he ushers. What are you wasting time for? Go get my suit. And hurry. That Holstein over there keep winking at me. And so, a little gobsmacked that to seemingly protect himself, this man has decided to dress as a cow and hide in the pasture, has also tasked us with investigating the strange growth south of the fork. With the runic bomb in hand, we again venture to the alien growth below the fork that leads to Adria's shack. We toss the bomb on it to clear the path, and it explodes. However, we don't see the man's house in sight that he mentioned. Perhaps the growth swallowed his house. Or worse yet, there was no house. Perhaps the man had been traumatized by entering the sickly hive himself. But that doesn't explain his poorly made cow suit. We're just thankful that there are still three cows in the pasture, and he didn't feel compelled to hollow one out for his own makeshift suit. Heading down into the festering hive, we're immediately assaulted by its inhabitants, the bloated fell twins with two heads, wispy floating mummies known as the shredded, and scampering venomous stingers nip at our heels. Stepping through the sludge and avoiding the acid baths, amidst the mucus-covered walls, the hulking hellbores emerge to encircle and end our intrusion upon their moist, membrane-covered refuge. As we delve deeper, cleaving what seems to be fleshy birthing pods, the resident arachnids defend their lair with zeal, disturbed by the warmth of life, or perhaps in search of a sumptuous snack. On the third level of the festering hive, we are bombarded by necro orb magica. The tentacled cyclops produce a hail that nearly halts our entire search, however, to no avail. Or so we think. After an arduous undertaking and clearing the cavern, we realize we're actually lost in this maze. And perhaps worse, maybe led astray. We begin to question, what if this nut has misled us and works for the hive mind? His brain, a mush that answers only to a defiler below. It's then we see a stray necro orb. We race to fell it before succumbing to its sickly magics and what's this? A cow suit crumpled in the corner. We cannot believe our luck, but as we pick it up, we see fresh blood on its nose. Although we have no illusion where our own leathers come from, this furry fruit really does take the cake for depravity. Portaling back to town, we hastily hand him the smelly suit, but he rebukes us, saying, No, 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 no! This is my grey suit! It's for evening wear! Formal occasions! I can't wear this! 
What are you, some kind of weirdo? I need the brown suit. We cannot help again but ponder. Who's crazier, the fool or the fool that follows him? It's on the fourth level we're approached by an entirely new enemy, the pincered lash worms, whipping neath their abdomen with their scissor-like appendages. Worse yet, as time wears on, we're beginning to be hunted by entire packs of venom tails, led by their spider lords. The corrosive acid of the venom tails bites into our armor, and we realize, as we cook, is that the brown cow suit? Perhaps we spy it though, too late. The demon's acid is eating the metal of our protective plate. After a few hard blows, Arcane's valor disintegrates to the floor and is no more. It's then we're exposed to the whipping barbed tails, yet somehow vanquish the last of the enemies before we succumb to their lethal toxin. Wasting no time, we scoop up the brown suit, a horned mass of cow outerwear, and portal back to town, outfit in hand, to meet a smiling man, looking like a complete nut as he advises. Ah, oh, that's much better. Ah, oh, at last some dignity. Are my antlers on straight? Good. Look, thanks a lot for helping me out. Here, take this as a gift. And, you know, a little fashion tip? You could use a little... You could use a new... You know what I mean? The whole adventurer motif? It's just so retro. Just a word of advice, eh? Ciao. And with that, the nut gifts us a plate of our very own bovine armor. We recoil in slight horror at the udders and cow motif. However, although our fashion sense somewhat differs from this deranged milkman, the armor stats are, admittedly, quite formidable. No doubt due to being an exploit or easter egg armor only available in single player, the bovine plate boasts armor class 150, plus 50% light radius, which is good or bad depending on how you like a light radius radius, plus 30 resist all, minus 5 damage from enemies, the downside is minus 2 to all spell levels and minus 50 mana, and a required strength of 50 plus indestructible. So not really ideal for a mage, but a warrior who just got his armor cooked, well, I might just wear it out of town. And with that, we turn to the complete nut to say thanks. However, we see across his face a euphoric grin. He returns to character once more and seemingly refuses to break, having gotten what he wanted. Instead, simply saying, Mo, no, 